In the second half of 1938, the world was clenching its teeth once more as it would seem that ever increasing aggressive speech resides from the government of Germany and the Empire of Japan. But then, on October 31st, something terrible happened in the US. As people were going about their daily lives, a shadow fell over the area of Newark, Philadelphia and surrounding small places. A giant howling object could be seen floating in the sky. Though first people thought it was some experiment by the Germans or the Japanese, it soon became apparent that no one in this world had the capability to produce something like this. After just looming high above the cities and towns for a few days, contact was made by a black little metal object proclaiming themselves probe droids. Through some sort of projector, the leader of the unidentified faction made himself be known as Emperor Palpatine, conqueror of worlds all throughout the galaxy. He had taken over many worlds before and enslaved its population to fight for them. His goal was to dominate over all life and Earth was next. It was not his goal to destroy the planet, but rather conquer it and its people. America had been chosen as the first target, but others would follow soon. Of course the people of Earth would not stand for this, and a war declaration between the people of Earth and the so-called Galactic Empire was made. Soon after, smaller flying ships ejected from the larger sprawling ones and let out troopers dressed in white armor and giant tank-like vehicles moving on two or sometimes even four mechanical legs. Often they were dropped outside the cities and suburban areas and marched in where they faced off against the US Army. For the initial assault with Earth, Palpatine had issued the deployment of 120,000 units. Philadelphia and Newark were taken in only a matter of days. Many assumed that they would have weapons tech very different from Earth's. And they were right. The initial confrontations were an absolute disaster for the US Army. The labeled stormtroopers were accompanied by the giant spider-like robots that had good oversight due to their height. For now, Earth did not want to use artillery as they were fighting in the streets and neighborhoods of their own people. Many of the soldiers lost their lives in a matter of seconds. The giant spider droid was able to crumble buildings with the slightest of ease. Though the soldiers were disheartened by the sight of the spider droid, they were happy to acknowledge that the men in white armor could be killed. The battle then shifted towards the countryside, surrounding the taken cities as the Galactic Imperial forces were getting closer to Washington. Here in the open, the people of Earth were not afraid of using artillery and it was very effective against the invading infantry and some of their lighter armor. It did not take long before America realized it would need help with this alien menace. 
A few factions seemed open to aid them in the process of fending Palpatine's forces off, but the Allies were the logical choice. The United Kingdom and France were amongst the first of the Allied nations to ensure that reinforcing troops were on their way towards the American shores. The Americans by then had already lost almost 10,000 men. UK's Prime Minister Chamberlain saw this as an opportunity to opt for a war industry without his own country's ground being directly under attack. Regardless, he also realized that Britain was under direct threat as the enemy's ships could arrive at other nations as well. France, on the other hand, thought outward and invested time and money in a capital ship focus program. This was to support the sent troops to America and in their mind to provide artillery support from the seas against the enemies in the sky. The battle for Washington had commenced. Set up heavy defenses kept the enemy at bay, but it came at a great cost. Where Washington's center was a bit more difficult to get a hold on for Palpatine's forces, in the neighboring suburban areas, fighting happened at close range and losses were felt on both sides. After the initial defeats at places like Philadelphia, the human armies had learned a little bit of how to fight the enemy's armor, of which they had plenty. Besides just the towering spider droids, they had smaller and more agile ones on two legs. They received the nickname of Chicken Walkers, and though their weapons were deadly, their armor could be more easily penetrated by human artillery and tanks than their spider droid counterparts. Seeing the pacing of the enemy's movement come to a halt gave a big boost in morale to the armies of Earth. And they needed this badly, as within another week, almost 6,000 men lost their lives. With Palpatine's armies moving towards the north, it was likely that Canada would be the next nation to directly come into contact with them at the border. The enemy kept on taking more harbor. Nevertheless, despite these wins here and there, overall, the enemy was still advancing. Help was indeed on the way from Europe, but with each passing day, 
Palpatine's army created an ever so increasing dominant position. Everyone just hoped that it wasn't too late already. The war between Palpatine's forces and the soldiers of Earth was now raging on for a whole month. In that time, the galactic invaders had gained immense amounts of territory as they expanded north and south. The Americans lost 34,000 men in that short amount of time, and Canada lost 2,000. It was disheartening to some that they had only been able to kill about 5,000 of the enemy, which had increased its forces with its first major wave of reinforcements. In some parts of Europe, they did not seem to care about the galactic invaders, and instead aimed at inner concerns as they saw this as an opportunity or overconfidence of their own capabilities. But December proved to be a bit more prevailing for the people of Earth. The enemy's pacing slowed down, and on some parts, even counter-assaults were organized. These were often done in the mountains and dense forests by infantry, and open fields mostly dominated by artillery. By now, the British had also set foot and got involved in the fighting. Many of their troops were chosen to defend the dockyards down south along the coast. Moreland inward, some of the French had started to aid the American and Canadian troops, where the battles in the forests and mountains could now be won by the American infantry. The flat terrain of the farmlands was a different story. The stormtroopers traversed the lands at a great pace. For spearhead attacks, they resorted to lighter armor in the form of the TX-130. Rather than a walker that was slower, the TX-130 had a more similar design to that of a traditional tank, even with a gunner on top of it. The speed and size of these vehicles made them difficult to hit and pinpoint by artillery. The Americans, accompanied by the British, Canadians and French, resorted to more traditional tactics. They would set up defensive perimeters with sandbags and improvised barricades. They would try to keep the vehicles at bay with AT weapons as their riflemen did the rest. Often it came at a great cost. A single TX-130 was able to rip a full squad of soldiers to shreds in seconds. Their backup mortars also were deemed KIA in a short notice. Many of the soldiers would fall back and fire at the enemy from the nearby farmhouses, but a few stayed near the sandbags to try and kill any galactic invader coming too close. The open field did not provide cover for them so they had to resort to using any TX-130, even crippled ones, to provide this necessary cover. With a few lucky shots, the US and British tanks were able to destroy a couple of enemy armor along with the help of the AT gunners on their left flank. In the event of an exploding TX-130, it often was accompanied by the destruction of several units who took cover near it. Battles like these were fierce and took a huge toll on both sides. There were battles where the galactic invader would breach through and then there were those where they would retreat to fight another day. In January, the assaults by Palpatine's armies had turned into chaos. Several high-ranking officers had underestimated the Earthen armies to succeed into achieving counterattacks. 
This cost multiple high-ranking people their lives, as they were killed for their repeated failures. By now, many countries had bled side by side, fighting against a common enemy. Though the difference in loss was still staggering, the earthen infantry did manage to become ever so more efficient at claiming a higher kill count. Some cities that had been overrun were even taken back. This meant that some of Palpatine's armies had to turn around and retake these places again. This gave the other armies more land inward the time to set up either a solid defensive line or preparations for a counter-assault. For the rest of January, the people of Earth were able to hold the line and prevent the stormtroopers from advancing further. But in the back of their minds, many soldiers feared the day where Palpatine would send in another wave of reinforcements. By using these strategies, the people of Earth had also prevented the galactic invaders from ever reaching Canada. U.S. soil had been the only thing poisoned thus far by the invaders from outer space, and the people of Earth would see to it that it stayed that way. With the help of the bombastic artillery from sea as backup, British soldiers managed to take back Washington, a tremendous victory and morale booster to soldiers everywhere. But that feared day of a new wave of reinforcements did indeed arrive. Another 100,000 units were sent to the surface, and in no time, Washington was taken back. of 1939, Britain had come under attack from Palpatine's armies. It was the second nation he directly invaded. The results were much more fruitful compared to the US. The British were surprised and heavy losses both domestically and in America made it very easy for the stormtroopers to traverse the British lands. Britain would surely fall quite soon and so Palpatine resumed to concentrate mostly on the combat within America. Only a week into the war, the British monarch fled the country to take refuge in the British Raj. Asia had not even tasted combat yet with the Imperial Galactic Invaders, and thus, this seemed like a wise choice. With the government's exile, the country's demise was indeed set in stone. Though some bigger cities had enough weapons and heavy defensive guns to deal with the incoming armor, Smaller, countryside towns did not. They were often decimated from afar by incoming walkers, forcing the Brits to fight amongst rubble and ruin. The few AT weapons that they possessed were often destroyed in a matter of moments, forcing them to fight in the streets and from one house to another.
Though the incoming armor could not patrol the town with all the rubble on the street, it still was able to shoot at the infantry from the open field as the ruins gave way for great oversight. The British were pinned, and though many stayed to fight for that which they loved and wanted to protect, most of them died in vain. Palpatine's forces spread like wildfire throughout the UK. as the white armored armies drew closer and closer. Then by the 1st of May, a division of British Raj soldiers managed to liberate London. Most of the Imperial Galactic troops had moved out towards the US to reinforce the main assault to the west. This gave some other armies the opportunity to reclaim the UK. Canada by now had been invaded on the eastern part. The stormtroopers mostly faced resistance from French and leftover British here. The Canadians set up to fend off the aggressors moorland inward. In a month, armies from different nations managed to retake most of Britain back. This time,
but the same would count for the Panzers as the Lewin Tridroids were slow and easy targets. During some of these fights, the Galactic Imperial soldiers resorted to Imperial tank destroyers. Vehicles that resembled an earthen tank even more than the TX-130 did. They were sturdy, but not very powerful. The accompanying infantry often would not see much combat. Both sides often would not engage close enough to where heavy infantry warfare would occur, rather aiding both their armored forces to hold in case repairs were necessary. At the same time though, Germany continued to wage war on neighboring countries, still under the motto of uniting all countries under one banner to get a better chance of facing off against Palpatine and his minions. And all the while, America continued to be destroyed. It would indeed seem that the central point of the war would soon shift towards that of Europe. America mourned the loss of their country, but it also fueled their hearts into fighting off the enemy even more. They stood beside their American and Canadian brothers to fight to the bitter end. The German display of dominance over the galactic forces was staggering. By liberating France but keeping ownership of its territory, the German government got its wish of soldiers fighting under one banner. Despite France having capitulated, there were still many French who were able to fight and they would gladly pick up arms to get but a chance to kill a stormtrooper. But by the end of August, hopeful spirits were crushed as news came out that the United States had capitulated and were now officially under control of Palpatine. Emperor Palpatine ordered one of his generals, the feared Lord Darth Vader, to issue an official to govern and look after the US to keep it secure. The one responsible for the failure to hold the UK had already been dealt with. Next up on their targeting sector seemed a logical choice. With America down, it was now Canada's time to burn. Though Canada managed to keep the Imperial troops at bay up until now, they soon realized this was only because Palpatine had not set his focus completely on their country. The Galactic Empire was advancing rapidly using more armor, including a vehicle labeled the AAT, an older design used in some of Palpatine's earliest conquests. The, the armor was bulky and would be functioning as a shield as it spearheaded in front of the troops. And though they stampeded over the Canadian grounds, the Canadians made them pay dear for it.
Artillery kept the enemy infantry at a distance. Amongst the stormtroopers, droid infantry could be spotted as well. They were not very threatening, but only functioned to increase the number of units sent out in the open field. The Canadians had set up multiple defensive lines around artillery sections. Though the artillery was very effective on the Galactic Infantry units, they always seemed to send in more. It was a manner that repeated itself multiple times, where Palpatine won a fight and gained territory in Canada, but with a high toll in loss of stormtroopers and armor. But this could not be seen in Europe. All that could be seen here was an ever-expanding Germany. Italy at the same time had also gained much territory in former France, benefiting both parties. Though the battles went well on all fronts, both invasion forces had not been completely dealt with yet. Realizing that Russia would have its part to play in this conflict as well, the German government agreed to allow them ownership over the eastern half of former Poland. Due to this offer, Russian soldiers joined the German assaults near the coast. Their sturdy Russian tanks joined the German panzers side by side. Palpatine was glad with the way things were going. He realized that Europe would need more effort to conquer, and he would concentrate over the coming months on the Americas before changing continent once more. When France capitulated, part of its population fled to Africa, who labeled themselves Free France. But after seeing the dominant display of Germany, many realized that they had to join forces. They did so under the name Vichy France. Spanish were sent over the hill as well under the lead of General Franco. Many Europeans bonded together and fought under one banner as predicted months earlier. Then a month after America had capitulated, Canada gave in as well. With two nations down, Palpatine had not to worry about the North anymore. Leaders were anticipating his next move. Some believed he would attack a nation on a different continent far from the conquered territory while others believed he would move down south. In case Africa would be attacked, Vichy France would act as the link between a resupply of men and weapons from Germany, Italy, Russia and retaken Britain. Despite victories time and time again, the Germans were unable to completely root out the stormtroopers down at the coast that had been there since the initial invasion. Britain, that had been retaken so valiantly, came under attack once more from the inside. This time, it was not at the same staggering pace, but for the Brits, it was enough to ring the alarm. Mexico then requested to join the Axis forces, as they announced to the world that they had been invaded by Palpatine's forces. The war, as it seemed, would now move southward. It was October of 1939, and by now, Germany had set their foot down on multiple countries, uniting the nations and joining forces in preparation for another assault by Palpatine. But the Galactic Emperor was occupied in Mexico at the moment. Things moved fast and against the Mexicans' favor. The open terrain and deserts were part to blame, as both walkers, Imperial armor, and even infantry had free shooting range on any earthly resistance they encountered. Though initially the battles in Britain seemed to steam off again as a new invasion force attacked them, 
it was still not at the same devastating speed as with the first invasion. The Brits had learned from their mistake during the first clash and were better defended all throughout the country. By December, Mexico had capitulated. It was now a question of what would happen next. Small countries stood between Palpatine's armies and the giant known as South America. Yet many still believed he would initiate an attack on either Africa or Asia first. If an attack on South America would commence, it might take a while to prepare, as the hundreds of thousands of units would need to be migrated along very narrow routes. The death toll for the Empire was really getting up there, but with almost a million troops stationed and ready across America, they did not fear resistance to come from the South. A few days before Christmas, two armies initiated small invasions on two separate beaches in Florida. But the Emperor's gaze and grasp upon American soil had tightened over the months since it had capitulated. Bunkers at the coast had been fortified, and rapid blaster gun nests were sprawled all throughout. Artillery fired upon the troops from various countries, who desperately tried to reignite the fight for the U.S. Though armor from various nations of Earth could damage and even destroy the galactic armored units, it was difficult to nearly impossible to get armor support on the beach. Their ships would assist with bombardments on the shore and further land inward, but they were harassed from the skies by deadly TIE fighters. The coastal invasions eventually led to devastation. The men of Earth paid in dear blood and realized that maybe the U.S. was forever lost. They could not afford another failure like this. Despite the people fearing for the well-being of small nations like Guatemala and Honduras, Palpatine seemed to be patient. In the first week of January 1940, nothing had happened yet. This boosted the fear that he might unleash an assault on earlier mentioned Africa, Asia, or a different angle into Europe. But eventually Palpatine greenlit the crossing of the border and Guatemala got overwhelmed. Then the disturbing news arrived that China had capitulated in the Sino-Japanese War that had fired off before the galactic invasion by Emperor Palpatine. Japan stood victorious, and in a move similar to that of Germany, it tried and continued to strengthen its grip over Asia as preparations to counter the stormtroopers and droids were they to invade their nation. By February, the next small nation on Palpatine's conquest fell, much to everybody's expectation. Britain by now had successfully cornered the second invasion force and was confident to rid themselves of this situation in the next few weeks. Vichy France, the nation standing beside the German government, was given reports of rebels who vowed to fight for the principles of the Free French. Indeed, they saw Palpatine as an enemy too, but they wanted to fight him along other nations and not for one in particular. It was the increasing dominance of Japan being similar to that of Germany that fueled this rebellion. Then by the end of February, Palpatine did indeed surprise a lot of nations by attacking a new country. But it was no country in South America nor was it in Africa or Central Europe. It was the Soviet Union, Mother Russia herself, that was chosen as their next target. But Russia had withstood invasions again and again all throughout time and had not been crushed once. It was not planning on being defeated this time either. First off, Palpatine made a mistake by attacking in the winter. There are very few who can survive the harsh Russian winters other than the Russians themselves. For the Russian soldiers who came all the way from the north, it was even considered 
fair weather. Since Germany had showcased that armor support would be very helpful in these battles, Stalin ordered a priority on increase of armor and artillery production. Though the Soviet government also knew that infantry itself could not do much against the galactic invaders, as most of the battles would be decided by which armor units would stand upright at the end, they still demanded hundreds of thousands of Soviet infantry to accompany the assault. Many died during charges that did not achieve anything. Their angle of invasion also had a similar mistake as with the German one. The armies of the Soviet Union became quick to realize that the enemy could be cornered and pushed back into the sea. Some would be evacuated in their shuttles, but many would be crushed under the boot of the Red Army. was holding its breath. Another continent was about to get burned. More than half a year passes without Palpatine, the Galactic Emperor and Conqueror of Worlds, doing anything significant in any of the continents. Africa still waited and reinforced its coastal defenses as publicly the Free French support had increased and was allowed to be established in Africa as an independent governing organ. Japan continued with its war path and a taste for blood. 
Mongolia had capitulated next, giving Japan a new angle to attack Russia that had already been invaded. Japan's power and influence spread like wildfire. They were now the most dominant conquerors with Germany having mellowed back in Europe. Then as 1941 was coming to an end, Palpatine finally showed another sign of life. And he struck hard upon Venezuela that had united itself with former Colombia. The battling was done amongst the jungles. But where the Americans had an advantage in forest battles, the South Americans did not. Their equipment and training was not as good and many lives were lost during these skirmishes all throughout the country. And three weeks later, Venezuela had fallen. Their conquest to unite with Colombia was for naught. During these battles in the jungle, Emperor Palpatine resorted to different types of units, where he had used his regular stormtroopers and older resources like droids, he now sent in units labeled clone troopers. Though similar to Stormtrooper, to the average person, in reality, these units were cheaper and quicker to make. With accelerated growth implemented, a clone army could be established twice as fast. They were more obedient than Stormtroopers, but often their given equipment and aided armor were less high caliber. Since they were cheaper to make, they were seen by some as expendable. The fights in these jungles did require a high death toll to pay, but the clones never complained. Not a single one. Next up was Brazil. The battles here often went the way of the Imperial Stormtroopers and Clone Troopers, but their pacing slowed down significantly. The jungle was thick and went on for miles and miles and miles. It was nature itself that these Stormtroopers were now battling too. The Brazilian army had set up heavy defenses near bridges crossing the rivers. By doing this, they created choke points and gave the stormtroopers absolute hell for every checkpoint they tried to conquer. But it was not just Brazil that had to deal with the invaders. Neighboring countries burned as well, and these had a lot more difficulty as they were smaller and less prepared. Peru was the next to fall, giving Palpatine's troops a long line down south towards the remaining nations that resisted. It took more than two months for the stormtroopers and clone troopers to traverse the Amazon and now they were spreading throughout the country and off to Bolivia to the west as well. By now, Palpatine had lost almost a million of his own men. A while back, Earthen Intel stated that his manpower was at an all-time low. It seemed that the half year of absence was used to resupply and reinforce his troops on Earth. Then some new movements were heard in Europe, as Italy now felt upon itself to make another move like Germany and Japan had done before. It set its claws in Greece to the south, and was completely surprised by the sudden attack. The Italian aggression was overwhelming. Brazil had not fallen yet, but the first of Palpatine's troopers headed into Argentina, the last large nation that stood between the Galactic Empire and total domination in South America. For now, some of the smaller nations seem to be left alone, probably as both Palpatine and their governments knew their resistance would be futile. A flood of refugees from those countries at the sea border headed towards Asia. By May 12th, it came out that Greece had capitulated. It never stood a chance, as they were completely surprised by the overtaking. Due to the aggressive nature by nations like Germany, 
Japan and Italy, smaller countries in Europe were now more alert. Halfway through June, the final battles for Brazil would take place. The steep cliffs and mountains made it difficult to traverse, but eventually the galactic forces and Brazilians would meet in their city of God, Rio de Janeiro. And two weeks later, it was Palpatine who stood victorious. This meant that the troops and armor stationed in Brazil would continue to move down and support the armies taking down Argentina. With Argentina soon to fall, and only small nations standing in Palpatine's way, it was very clear that a new continent would soon feel his wrath. But the Japanese seemed not to focus on that right now, as they sent in more troops towards the front line with the Soviet Union. The Argentinian terrain was easier to traverse, meaning they lost territory at a quicker pace than before. The battle for Buenos Aires would soon take place, and the galactic invaders had them surrounded. And then by the second week of August, Argentina, the last major nation in South America, was lost as well. The alarms were raised, and the Soviet government pleaded the Japanese to stop, as this would only harm both armies in the end. But Japan did not give in. They saw their plead as weakness. Though, there were some respected Japanese writers who questioned their government's views and that they themselves underestimated the enemy galactic invader. The Soviets did not want to spend their best equipment and armor on the Japanese. It would be a waste for when they would get into conflict with Palpatine once more. But by not doing so, they handed some of the locations over to the Imperial Japanese on a silver platter. The Soviets had a ton of men available at all times, but the Japanese used Chinese replacements to always keep the pressure on them. Both governments forced many men to their deaths for a war that in the end might achieve nothing. The entire front line was also so wide that the Japanese always could get away with a victory somewhere. The huge increase in artillery and armor meant that Russian soil was difficult to get a hold of on many places, but not all places. Thinly spread areas were soon overrun by Japanese, who could then flank the heavier fortified position to move the entire army further west. For the next months it stayed quiet as the Galactic Emperor cleaned up the remaining nations that were still standing in South America. It was halfway through 1943 when Intel suggested that Palpatine could have closed the three million troops on the ground spread out throughout the Americas. But over time, the countries that joined against Palpatine increased too, and they assumed they had a combined fighting force of somewhere close to eight million, almost three times that of Palpatine. Support bases, checkpoints, and hundreds of thousands of troops were being moved along the American ground. It was clear that a new target would soon be chosen. Japan made headway against the Soviets. They were underestimated by Stalin. This mostly came due to Russia dividing their resources and expenses between the two sides. On one end, they were battling the Japanese, but the others were preparing for another clash with Palpatine. The Japanese, on the other hand, were focusing all their resources on Russia alone. For months, Palpatine did not attack a single nation, but most knew they were at his mercy. Another half year went by, and then, in the first month of 1944, Palpatine's new target had been decided. He invaded Africa. The initial invasion force was small and used the African jungle as cover in the first few days of the new war campaign to keep the location concealed. But it would not be long before more troopers would arrive and the Emperor's might and darkness would spread throughout the ancient continent of Africa. Hey everyone! Thanks for tuning in for another exciting episode. Before we begin, I would like to announce that I started uploading Men of War Assault Squad 2 co-op content on the Looping Reel Gaming channel, the channel run by me and my friends Ryan and Greg. The game Men of War is what I use in this series for the battle scenes, 
and we will do a lot of co-op missions on the Looping Reel Gaming channel, including different mods and scenarios. So if you are interested in seeing more of that game, please head on over to the Looping Reel Gaming channel and support us. You can find the link to the channel in the description down below. I really appreciate your support and enjoy the rest of the episode. The war with the Galactic Invader had now been spurring on for almost six years. In that time, technology had changed and certain nations had fallen. as almost static turret support. The human tanks could easily outrun them, but their thick armor plating was a different story. British and Americans who fled to Europe were the ones to face off against Palpatine in this continent. For the infantry, Palpatine resorted to sand troopers, stormtroopers that had trained in similar terrain like this. In the rear, clone troopers provided sniper support. Though the armor and weapons of the clones were older models and therefore less effective, the clones did have one big advantage over the stormtroopers that was displayed over the last couple of weeks and that was their obedience and loyalty. If an order would be given from their higher up, or Palpatine himself, a clone would not hesitate to shoot one of their own. Stormtroopers were a different story. Some were bound to flee, break down in fear, or worse, switch sides. According to one stormtrooper who switched sides, these forms of rebellion had been as old as the first conflicts by Palpatine. Those who did not share his vision would wait until contact with the inhabitants of targeted planets could be established and then switch sides to fight for them. This happened in every following conflict, but up until now the locals had always lost, even with the help of the rebels. The rebels who joined the humans of Earth would land their expertise on Imperial tech strategy and intel. 
Though they shared some of their own weapons, most generals wished to refrain and finish the invader with their own earthly weapons and armor that had evolved over time itself. The betrayal of some of these stormtroopers caused some of the confrontations to end up as a failure for the galactic invader. One of these losses was felt by General Hux, a young and ambitious man who had some wins under his belt during the conquering of South America. Kylo Ren, a higher up in the First Order, an elite brigade and section of Palpatine's force, was outraged. He taunted Hux that a clone with older weapons and gear would at least obey its master. How capable are your soldiers, General? I won't have you question my methods. They're obviously skilled at committing high treason. Perhaps Leader Snoke should consider using a clone army. My men are exceptionally trained, programmed from birth. As this debacle unfolded in Africa, in Europe, people were worried about the ever-increasing dominance of Japan. Palpatine for the time being was moving down south, and it would still take time for him to conquer the Middle East. This gave the Europeans the message that they had still time to resolve this issue with either the Soviets or the Japanese. Because of this issue with Japan, Soviet help in Africa was minimal. They simply could not afford it, as they had to think about their own nation first. This meant that a lot of Brits and Americans died in Africa, achieving absolutely nothing. Panic was on everyone's thoughts in Europe. In every country and nation, defenses and bunkers were set up awaiting the confrontation one day with the Galactic Invaders' forces. Palpatine had more reinforcements arrive from the Americas to Africa. There was a lot of ground to cover, and the deployment took more time than expected. But then on the 16th of November of 1945, the shocking news came out that Tokyo had fallen. With Japan being so focused on the war with Russia, they simply forgot to look behind them. An invasion force, rather small compared to that of South America or Africa, had landed and had desecrated entire cities in a matter of hours. Japan had capitulated. And with that, the war against the Soviets disappeared like mist. Without a government to lead them, many of the Japanese currently in Russia surrendered. The Soviets allowed the Japanese to serve under a communist government and granted them asylum for the time being until either Japan was retaken or new ground had been claimed in their name. With Mother Russia back in Soviet hands, people were relieved, but also worried now that Palpatine had set foot in Asia. By now, more and more countries had sided together, not in a coalition, but as fellow people of Earth swearing to fend off Palpatine and his men. But the country that broke this was Germany. Merely three months after the Japanese had lost their nation, Barely enough time for the citizens of the Soviet Union to get used to peace within their borders once more, Germany invaded the Soviets from the West. The communist struggle with the Japanese was a sign for the German government that the Soviet Union was vulnerable. Once again, under the motto of uniting nations under one banner, they invaded the country. But the Soviets would strike back hard. Stalin had some of his best artillery and armor divisions stationed in this area as it previously fell victim by Palpatine. Not only that, the fact that the Soviet Union had been interwoven in a war for the last years meant that their technological breakthroughs were more impressive since the state that befell on their nation demanded this. But the Germans were also a fiercer enemy than the Japanese were. Their armor and weapons were more advanced, and thus, they proved quite the challenge. But the Japanese had surprised the Russians previously, something that now did not happen, even though they did not foresee former colleague Germany commit such an act. The front line was not as wide as during the Japanese assault, and the Germans had a lot more trouble getting through, even in the less defended areas. The battles that were now being fought between the nations on Earth still demanded for technological breakthroughs to continue. In the end, 
The generals were sure it would benefit them once they would face the emperor once more. And as Palpatine's grasp increased ever so over Africa, towards the Middle East, a shadow fell over Europe once more as two titans, Germany and the Soviet Union, clashed with each other. As multiple wars were spewing over the nations of Earth, Palpatine slowly made his way towards the Middle East. He had already conquered much of Egypt. into Europe. At the moment, they were mostly facing French resistance from the Free France nation. In Europe, the war did not go in Germany's favor. The Soviets were pushing them west and the communist Japanese managed to perform a successful naval invasion near former Denmark. The combined Japanese strength made up for many losses that were suffered during the initial conflict with the Imperial Japanese. Saudi Arabia continued to suffer at the hands of Palpatine. The only way to reinforce and resupply the troops of Earth was through Iraq, but that front grew narrower with each day. And then finally Saudi Arabia crumbled. With Palpatine's focus on getting into Europe via its southern approach, he once again seemed lackluster about the battles happening in Central Africa. The people of Earth managed to pull off various victories here and there. In the final month of 1947, the stormtroopers stood on Turkey's doorstep. It was the final line to keep them from entering Europe once more. Fighting would be done in the hills. The hills were not steep enough to where walkers could not be used. But the cover they provided was taken in advantage by the people of Earth. It would not be long before Germany itself would fall and become communist as well. The aggressive nature by the communist Japanese, led by Kyuichi Tokuda, was thought by some to be because they would be granted conquered German lands by their Soviet masters. But this was pure speculation. Though the Japanese did manage to pull off victories, they were still looked down upon by multiple nations. They were now seen as lapdogs, doing their new master's bidding. And it was but a question if Stalin truly trusted the Japanese and would give them back an honest amount of land after things had settled.
it still was the case that the Germans had more advanced weaponry and each victory for the Japanese came at a high price. But it was a bargain for Stalin who achieved victories for the glory of the Union without spilling his own men's blood. Chances were high that once Germany had capitulated, Stalin would focus on help from their direct units due to their advantage in terms of armor and weapons alike. He would choose them over the Japanese. With these wars eventually leading up in the advantage of the Soviets, their common turn faction rose to an incredible powerful one that would clearly become the main enemy of Palpatine. But for now, the current wars with other nations of Earth needed to be cleaned up. As the conflict with Turkey was unleashed, Palpatine sent his forces into Iraq as well to conquer new angles which he could use to invade Turkey with. The fact that the Galactic War campaign in Africa was faltering was a sign that Stalin had time to reorganize once the dust had settled over Europe. By February of 1948, Iraq capitulated, giving Palpatine the desired new angle to attack Turkey. At the same time, he would move east and attack other nations to unlock new pathways into the mighty Soviet Union. But once more, the galactic invaders left openings in their rear guard, and it were the Brits once again who took this opportunity to win back territory. With Turkey now thrown into the conflict, the Soviets realized that Palpatine was a few months away from standing on their doorstep. They still had a war to finish in Central Europe, but took countermeasures as they fortified the mountains and hills bordering with Turkey. They hoped that bouldering artillery would keep the stormtroopers at bay once they had reached this zone. The fact that the front line would decrease into a narrow space would benefit the Soviets' battle plan. By the end of March of 1948, almost half of Turkey had already been seized by Palpatine, but they were not ready to throw in the towel just yet. The Turks were proud and had a history of the vying invasions after initial losses were taken. Iran was also losing ground rapidly. They were able to hold off the roads leading up to the Russian border, but it was India that suffered because of this. They had received supplies and armor from Britain previously though. History repeated itself as the armies of Earth tried to cut off the units that were heading in Europe and Asia. Saudi Arabia had almost been taken back in its entirety by the Brits. Then on the 18th of May 1948, it was announced that the German Reich had capitulated. Joseph Stalin was pleased, as this meant that the Axis faction altogether would soon come to an end. It would make his own faction the strongest and most resilient, as puppeted nations would join as well. The war between the armies of Earth was not over yet, but Germany was their strongest enemy, and with them gone, it would be easy to take over Italy and other allies of the Axis. Hungary was next to fall, and they did so not even two weeks after the official defeat of Germany. In Africa, Palpatine was heading down south again. He needed to assign a lot of resources and troops to maintain control wherever he went on the different continents. The Soviets had entered Italy, and to their west, the Free French had established a new government to deal with the leftovers who supported the dream of the former German government. But they had their hands full, as in June, Palpatine launched another invasion on their soil. This time, things went different though. Since the last invasion, technology had significantly changed, and the French artillery was brutal and precise. The invader would bleed heavily for every victory they claimed. At the end of June, Palpatine's campaign had ended in failure, as the nations of Earth were indeed able to cut off his troops who perished trying to take over Turkey, Iran and India at the same time. Though they were cut off, 
they did manage, in the end, to take back some of Saudi Arabia, and it looked like they were about to launch another assault up north. But the people of Earth were prepared. They had hopeful thoughts of stopping the advancing enemy in their tracks, just like they were doing in France, where a combined force drove the invaders back into the seas, crushing them on the waves. Earth was not ready to give in just yet. Halfway through 1948, the war was not only continuing to brew with the galactic invaders, but also amongst leaders on Earth themselves. Stalin's forces had invaded Italy, and without German support, they stood no chance. With a failed campaign in the north, Palpatine instead focused on the south and to seize the continent of Africa as a whole. Preparations for another charge up north were well on their way. Their invasion in Normandy also resulted in failure, with the French, British and remaining Americans claiming combined victories, fueling their spirits and hopes of achieving victory over Palpatine. In Central and South Africa, multiple nations were still present. It was already clear that they could not withhold the advance of the stormtroopers and clones, and therefore were ordered to evacuate to the nearest countries that welcomed them. It would seem that the main wars that were being fought would continue independently over each other over the coming months. Once the Soviets would take over Europe, and once Palpatine claimed Africa, they would face each other. Republican Spain, under lead of Jose Diaz, swore allegiance to the Axis back in the day and was now paying the price. But it was the Free French that were invading them, and not the Soviets. France hoped to strengthen their position with this move, after having lost some ground to Germany. Cape Commune capitulated in the third week of August. As evacuations were still underway in other areas of the continent, more people of Earth suffered who did not make it in time. Then in September, the Republic of Spain fell, and both Britain and France seized power, ground and equipment. But they feared what the Soviet Union had become now to the east, and with them on their doorstep, it was but a matter of time before they would be handed an ultimatum. Portugal had allied themselves as well with the Axis, and the same fate of Spain befell upon them too. In the Middle East, Palpatine unleashed his new campaign. After the Brits managed to get Saudi Arabia back, they were not able to hold it in the end. But though they lost that territory, the amount of armies from Earth that gathered at this front line was staggering. Many different nations got involved, and with each week, more and more rebels joined their cause. Italy was close to fall. Once Rome would be laid to ash, it was all over, and then officially, Stalin could set his gaze towards the stormtroopers. Then at the end of October 1948, Rome, the Eternal City, had fallen to the advancing Soviet spearheads. As Italian forces fell back, Russian troops fanned out into the city and dealt with the few remaining pockets of resistance. Most historical landmarks appeared to have suffered little damage, although there were conflicting reports that the Pantheon was raked by machine gun fire. With Rome gone, it was all but logical that Italy would capitulate and that the war between the Comintern and the Axis was officially over, with the Axis completely wiped out. Changes and distributions among Central Europe were done immediately. Governments serving the Soviet master were set in each nation to ensure that Stalin would rule here too with the Iron Fist. In Germany, Wilhelm Pieck of the KPD was put in charge to act as Russia's war dog if Palpatine managed to reach into Europe. In Italy, Mussolini was replaced by Palmiro Togliatti, who would be tasked with securing resources for many armies of the Comintern to ensure resupply and manufacturing 
could continue according to schedule. By now, things were starting to look up for the people of Earth. Over the many years that this war had raged on, they had killed over 7 million of their enemies. Now they stood united, almost 20 million, whereas Palpatine had 10 times less stationed on Earth. With the war in Europe being resolved, Stalin immediately ordered fresh troops to be sent off towards Africa and pushed the galactic invader back to the seas. In several locations of the Americas, the armies of Earth attempted naval invasions to claim back what was rightfully theirs. The British managed to succeed a massive invasion, but the jungle environment in South America was treacherous and it proved difficult to gain and claim territory. The Soviets attempted an invasion directly into the US, but they were soon surrounded. Palpatine made sure that the US coast was secure all over. They had a bit more luck down south, but here too they got met with difficult terrain to traverse. It would prove impossible to gain a foothold unless more nations joined in these invasions. Though multiple occurred at the same time, it was but a mere drop of water on a hot stove. Palpatine feared nothing and felt that his Americas were safe. But his Africa, not so much, as the armies of Earth headed closer and closer to former Egypt. More nations joined, and though everyone spoke a different language, they all had the same goal. It was ironic in a way that with Germany losing, it achieved what its former government wanted, for all to fight under one banner. By 1950, the armies of Earth had prepared a massive assault campaign to retake Africa. Once they would be re-established, they would focus on taking the Americas back. The first of the attacks were used to soften up the lines of the galactic invaders. With the front line widening after the bottleneck of the Suez, both clones and stormtroopers were shoulder to shoulder as heavier walkers, including massive spider-like walkers, were called in for reinforcements. Though the insect-like behemoths were quite menacing and their weapons were very powerful, they were one hell of an easy target. Artillery by 1950 had improved quite a bit and could hit such a large target from a distance where it was completely safe. Tanks were leading the charges as well and infantry were always right behind. Rumors were spreading that the army tech branches were working on a new type of transport, flying vehicles that could hold many infantrymen at once and drop them into the combat zone in the blink of an eye. This was the future, some argued. Weapons also gradually changed to more automatic ones, and many believed that this campaign would demand even more drastic changes to come and how the people of Earth was drawing to a close, it seemed Europe was once again 
intermingled in a war from within. But some people could see why this was happening. With the ever-increasing power and grip that Stalin held, he would be an absolute dictator over the entire world. A red world. In December, Paris fell as Soviet tanks paraded throughout the streets, showcasing all the power and might of Stalin the Almighty. The common turn was slowly swallowing the entire world, but the Allies were not completely obliterated yet. Stalin would now set his focus on Asia and eventually on Australia. Hey everyone, Happy New Year to all of you! In 2019, we of course continue our narrative series with another Star Wars vs Earth episode being the first of the year. I would like to inform you guys that a recent update of the War of the Worlds mod made it to where the coloring and name of the invading faction retracted to its normal self. Weirdly enough, its leader is still listed as Palpatine and even though I tried to redo what I did before to change the name to Galactic Empire, it would not change. That is why halfway through this episode and probably from now on onward, the color of the invading nation will be red and the name will say that they are Martians. I will try to hide the name and in the story they will still be the Galactic Invaders. With that being said though, please enjoy the rest of the video. It was the beginning of the 50s. The time that would be known as the drought would soon be upon the world. Battles were still raging on through Turkey for a second time. And as blood was spilled on their soil, Norway got to endure the wrath of Stalin. With the Soviet Union having forced its will upon so many nations, it became pretty much unstoppable. Weapons and armor had changed through the years. The nations that belonged to the common term were using the latest weapons known as the AK-47, the Kalashnikov, a weapon that would go down in history as the most reliable of all. For tanks, they relied on the newly created T-54, powerful enough to steamroll over any of Earth's nations. But if they would hold out against Palpatine's armies, would be a different story. Though Turkey was initially losing its battle with the stormtroopers, it was not the first time that they were able to come back from a similar position. Intel suggested that Palpatine's invasion force for Earth was almost at its limits. He surely possessed more fleets for backup, but his manpower around Earth itself seemed fleeting. Now this still meant that he had millions of troops stationed on Earth that would not go down without a fight. In Africa, another attempt was done by the armies of Earth of secluding the reinforcement and supply line around the Suez. Though it was expected that the Imperial Stormtroopers might still get it back, it did require effort and manpower on their part, meaning they were slowly dying by a thousand cuts. With Stalin setting his sights currently on Asia as well, it would not be too long before they would descend down all the way towards Australia. The armies were being assembled across the coastal line, but everyone knew that they could not win from this behemoth. The common term controlled almost every nation left on Earth, and Australia did not have the manpower nor the resources to deal with an attack on that scale. The Soviet Union seemed much more capable of dealing with the supply lines of Palpatine. They spread out quick.
Palpatine would not send in new reinforcements. Stalin's wrath could now also be felt all the way in the Dutch East Indies, meaning they were on Australia's doorstep. With the way the war was going now, it would seem that retaking Saudi Arabia would still take several months and maybe even years as most of the galactic forces still resided here. But the rest of Africa had only spread out armies that were of a modest size. By this time, jet fighters had come into play with the Earth and Air Force. They were now able to do bombing runs more quickly and at the same time be more effective at air support during large sieges. By July of 1952, the news came out that Australia and the Soviet Union had agreed on terms to make a peace deal, but it was not as black and white as it all seemed. Though the Soviets did agree to sign peace, they demanded several heads chosen by themselves to be assigned in the Australian office. Many could already see what this would mean in the long run. It seemed that by doing this, the Soviets would not have to waste any blood and manpower on conquering another nation of Earth, but instead they would destroy it from the inside out. Those assigned by the Soviets would be financially backed by them as well and would in due time stir up the hornet's nest to acclaim support for communism in the continent. With almost all earthly nations in the hands of Stalin, the long-awaited all-out assault on Africa was underway, and Stalin absolutely dominated. Taking notes from his former German comrade, he unleashed absolute hell on Palpatine's units stationed here. It became clear that no matter who would win in this conflict, that Earth, in the end, would be ruled by a tyrant. Even if the armies of Earth would win, Earth itself would still lose. Palpatine's coming had unleashed the apocalypse. Parts of Africa that had been conquered were temporarily handed over to other puppet governments as Stalin wanted but one thing, to have Africa in his hands. If Africa would be retaken, which is definitely pointed out towards that result, the next challenge for his armies would be to invade the Americas, a job easier said than done. With so many countries now combined under a red fist, the strength and manpower at its disposal surpassed 20 million soldiers. Palpatine had none of that, but he held the ground of the Americas, and over the past years, he built to keep those coastlines fortified. The Emperor had abandoned his troops in Saudi Arabia, who still fought valiantly. They continued the battle months after being cut off, some disillusioned on the note that Palpatine would send in reinforcements. By now, Africa had been divided in two parts remaining to the galactic invaders. To the west, a large chunk was broken, and the stormtroopers were defenseless. Unlike the soldiers battling in Saudi Arabia, many of the units surrendered and turned as rebels to fight alongside the humans of Earth.
and destruction. At the end of March of 1953, the Australians were sent out towards the southern tip of South America to initialize an invasion to recapture the continent. The absence of Palpatine's troops in the lower half meant that the Australian infantry were able to capture a dockyard in a matter of days and would spread like wildfire. They were ordered to head out in several divisions to capture and claim as much territory as they could, maybe even capturing more docks or establish usable airports. This was easier said than done. They hoped reinforcements would arrive quickly with the dockyard in the south in their hands. But it would take time to move that many soldiers over towards South America. And as a month had passed, barely any reinforcements had arrived. To make matters worse, the first of Palpatine's armies were on their doorstep. Things in Japan fared a bit better. The amount of resistance was laughable compared to what they had stacked up in the Americas. It would be a matter of a few more months before this last part in Asia would be in earthly hands once more. Saudi Arabia by now had also been recaptured, chopped up, and divided among several puppet governments that had adapted the communist way of thinking. According to Intel, the amount of units under Palpatine's command was so little that this was the time to attack, as reinforcements from space could be underway, and at this moment, there were less than 1.7 million units spread out around America. The Soviets unleashed attacks in the northern parts of South America, most notably to help the Australians and heeding the intel warning, but also to cover up the fact that Stalin had died weeks prior to this. The death of the dictator gave way to a sudden need to assign a successor. This also explained the reason why the Soviets demanded a different nation Australia in this case, to lead the invasion attempt instead of themselves. Nikita Khrushchev would follow in Stalin's footsteps and he had set his gaze towards America like a hawk. He said that the common turn ruled so much of the earth already that they had to take back America at all costs and erect a communist government in their name. By October of 1953, India had sent in their men as well to aid the Russians in the assault up north, but they were already being pushed back towards the shore. Another attempt seemingly doomed to fail. More Australians were at the ready in northern Africa to be sent over to any docks that the Russians or Indians would capture. But it would seem that they would not make the crossing in time if things kept going the way they were now. With Australia's gaze concentrated towards America, Stalin's last plan before he died came to fruition. The Australian politicians, assigned by the Soviet Union themselves, had used the opportunity of the absence on a look inward to hard turn the government towards that of communism. Riots soon erupted, but were put down partly by sent in Russian forces. Up north, the Comintern forces tried once more to use Florida as an anchor point to unleash a full invasion there. But with the bulk of Palpatine's army stationed here, it was simply too difficult to manage with just a small invasion army. In the northern part of South America, the Russians that were exhausted were replaced by the Turks and South Africans, who would move both west and south to hopefully be more successful. The Russian soldiers in Florida were trapped as now stormtroopers attacked from their rear angle and closed in on them by a pincer attack strategy. It would end in a bloodbath. The invasions everywhere ended in total failure. It was the most foothold the armies of Earth had in America since the longest time, and though it sparked some hope, the defeat fell harder than ever. By 1956, things still hadn't changed. Petty attempts by multiple nations still happened every now and then, but what many feared had come true. Palpatine had indeed been reinforced by a new fleet that had appeared above Earth. Their manpower had more than doubled, though the armies of Earth combined still had a strength that was almost ten times theirs. Halfway through 1958, still no invasion attempt had reached any more success than previously. This made it clear to nation leaders that the next big invasion would need to be on a larger scale 
with more preparation. The downside was that Palpatine, in turn, had more time to prepare or defend if he so chooses. The higher-ups in the Soviet Union agreed that a full-scale invasion including not thousands but millions of soldiers would be unleashed in 1960, at the dawn of a new era. The war with Palpatine had now been going on for over 20 years, and things had drastically changed on Earth. Besides new technological breakthroughs, the world's overall governments and ideology got plunged into darkness. The almighty Comintern stood opposite of the galactic invader. Many had envisioned that the attack of an extraterrestrial force would bind the humans of Earth under one banner and that this banner be set up all over the city's perimeter. One particular aspect that worked in the humans of Earth's favor was that Palpatine in the past years had erected many bunkers and fortifications himself. Those that were not destroyed during the bombing campaigns were then reused by the armies of Earth, saving them time and effort in fortifying taken places. The waters were bustling with life as many more fleets from different nations headed on over to do their part and partake in the battle. The events were closely followed on television and radios all over, and everyone was convinced they would win. The communist states would be led under the government of Earl Browder, handpicked by Khrushchev himself to handle things in America once the dust had settled. But aerial photos showcased what hell lay in wait for the soldiers from so many different countries who were now residing in America. Millions of stormtroopers, clones, droids, and other enslaved alien species descended down on the armies of Earth to crush them and send them back to the abyss of the ocean. The Turkish Empire was already facing massive trouble due to being undermanned and poorly equipped. Only a handful of galactic imperial resistance was enough to break their armies in half. But despite the troubled vision at the horizon, Intel suggested that the humans of Earth were on the winning side. Claiming important land pieces and achieving victories on the battlefield made their position known and sturdier as more reinforcements arrived from the continents to the east. But by February, only a month after the invasion was initialized, the first setbacks could be felt as Palpatine summoned every unit from every corner of the land to fight the armies of Earth. At multiple locations, entire armies were wiped out, pushing back the front and creating holes that would waver morale and the all-out possibility to advance west. From the north, casualties, 
and major losses were reported as well. The front line here was not as spread out, and defeat came down harder as the men had to fall back further than elsewhere. It seemed that the tide had turned and that another invasion attempt would end in failure. Was there nothing that the people of Earth could do? Many were afraid that they would be stuck in this limbo forever. The invasion and war that was unleashed on the former US soil in 1960 had a brilliant start, but was soon countered in a few months. The soldiers from various countries had managed to dig deep into the enemy territory, but countermeasures from every corner made them realize they stood no chance. At various regions, evacuations were already underway. Miscommunications resulted in several divisions not getting a clear picture of the war situation as a whole, and therefore, some believed the campaign was going better than it really was. But over the passing weeks, everyone got the message to head back to the coast and retreat. The ones that were furthest away often would not make it or make a last stand, only to be blasted to bits by the incoming stormtroopers and their powerful armor. Though the initial losses felt by Emperor Palpatine were quite heavy, overall, he still had more than 5 million men stationed in the Americas. This victory gave his troops a clear morale boost, though in the coming months they did not seem to make any intent on performing another invasion on one of the other continents. With the invasion having failed, the armies of Earth had little to do but wait again. If Palpatine would not be going anywhere, it was up to them to dictate the tempo by performing another invasion. They agreed that the next invasion would be done in 1965 in the hopes that in the coming five years, technological breakthroughs in weapons tech, armor and air support could make the difference this time. A few months after the invasion of America failed, something happened that many expected to happen a lot sooner. A revolt against the communists occurred in India where hundreds of thousands had enough of all the bloodshed and would not want to live in a world that was ruled by communist law. Demonstrations ended up in war-like scenes amongst the streets of India's biggest cities. Though those that rebelled were informed that many people in other countries thought the same way, help was left out, and they were not strong enough to oppose any threat to the ruthless reign of Khrushchev. The rebellion was short-lived, and thus humanity waited once more. Over the next five years, their tech and strategies did indeed change. New armor was introduced, with the T-62 and T-64 being some of the frontrunners to deal devastating damage from afar. With newly produced helicopters, infantry and supplies could be quickly deployed, being much more efficient than using paradrops. And finally, the Soviet government authorized the use of chemical warfare in the form of the
problem traversing here. The Comintern soldiers had managed to set foot in Florida for the third time. It was a pattern that had repeated itself more than once, but with the sky set ablaze and air support from both their own armies and rebel fleets, victory was a more convincing concept. The rebel intel advised the armies of Earth to attack sites where Palpatine had a lot of battle droids stationed. The battle droids were some of his oldest units used back in his earliest campaigns. They were controlled via a central control system on ships hovering high above Earth. Shooting down one of those control ships would result in thousands of droid units becoming useless, creating easy victory opportunities for the armies of Earth at hand. With backup from an unforeseen angle and human spirit high, the people of Earth were sure that this time victory was theirs. It was February of 1966.
to turn the tide of war. More nukes were dropped on American soil that was poisoned slowly with each drop. And even Canada was not spared, as Khrushchev wanted to finish off this conflict quickly. The bombs were always dropped way behind enemy lines to avoid friendly casualties. Washington was still considered a danger zone, but slowly the armies here were finally able to head northeast. This was the only side where progress was very slow. The second invasion within America was now going on for more than half a year. The spread of the earthen armies were incredible, clearly seen from aerial footage. The aerial footage also reconfirmed the dominance of Soviet and German armies throughout the American lands. Fled citizens and army soldiers originating from America were being sorted to head back into society in their former homes south and east, away from the battlefield lines. The war was going so well by now that new invasions at other parts were successfully pulled off. By now it was clear that several high-ranking officers in Palpatine's army had called for evacuations as more ships were destroyed high above the earth. To some, they already admitted defeat. In the east, a new invasion was set in motion as well by multiple nations. They were able to hold the coast relatively easily, but would have quite a task ahead of them to link up with the main armies to the west. Palpatine's most hardened units were still stationed here and would not, unlike others, wimp out and flee. Though the armies in the west that arrived with the recent invasion were making great progress towards the north, part of the stormtroopers had broken through and were moving down south, claiming some victories in the name of their emperor. The battlefields containing Palpatine's most battle-hardened units had been dubbed the Marshes of the Dead, as stories were told among soldiers at other places that the bodies piled so high that they reached above the waters left by all the crater impacts. The freshly arrived troops west and east were too few to really create a powerful pincer attack, but movement could be felt nonetheless. The troops to the east had a rough few first weeks, as they too would face the most elite units that Palpatine had to offer. But they had the advantage that they attacked their flank and had the element of surprise the first handful of days. The Imperial Galactic units alongside the west had managed to widen the gap between the two main forces, cutting like a knife through butter. But the front to their left increased as more parts of Canada were taken. The east spread out as well. They had more success north as there wasn't that much resistance, but the gains were not as rich or spoilful. By now, Germany had unleashed an invasion as well, hoping to cut off another head of the Hydra-like force that was presented by Palpatine's units to the east. The soldiers fighting at the west also had to bear hardships, but it was nothing compared to the ones in the east. But though blood was
than one might think. Though many men and women fought against the Galactic Invader, they did in fact not, unlike what the government wanted to believe, fight for communism or the Comintern. They fought for their own freedom. For the freedom of their families and friends, and for the freedom of planet Earth. Now that the dust had settled, for some, the battle was not yet over. As cities and towns were rebuilt, there were others that gathered men and would, over the time to come, try to find support for those to see that one tyrant had only been exchanged for another. There was a certain irony in the fact that to destroy the monster, one had to become the monster itself. Many would debate if the same result would have been granted where the earthen leadership not be so strict and absolute. Almost three years after the war had ended, much of the battle scars could still be seen and felt. Europe by then had not seen conflict for more than 10 years, and most that was left were the bunkers and fortifications, ironically mostly used to battle the Soviets. But in those three years, support for the return of democracy did indeed rise. Part of the rebel fleet that had aided in the decisive second invasion of America had left, but there were some rebels who realized that the Earth in the state would be no different than another terrorizing empire on a smaller scale. Under the cover of diplomatic interests, many stayed in different countries as they kept a sharp eye on the progress of anti-communist support. And then on the 14th of November, 1973, with help from the rebels that still remained there, a revolt occurred in Britain against the communist government. But it was not a sole incident comparable to the revolt in India. Germany and France joined as well, fueled by the resisting voices heard all the way from Britain. A revolution on this scale would be very effective, were it not that the Comintern held most of the world as a whole. Even with rebel help, it would still be difficult to take down the tyrannical government. But even the Russians themselves could no longer stand with the crude and cold stance taken by their own leaders. Millions joined and opted for freedom and to honor the values so harshly learned by having our home invaded.